All right, well, while we're all settling down, just a reminder, we're not going to have men's prayer breakfast this week. We're having it the following week, which will be on the 23rd. And we're not going to do breakfast. We're going to open it up to everybody. We'll probably have a few little noshy items. But uh, the focal point is that I've, I've been working and talking with different people running for office to get some uh, traction there. And um, Alexandra Mueller, who is running for county judge, is going to come and speak. And I think we're going to get somebody else. A county judge is the most important position in the county. A county judge is not a judge like any other judge. The county judge position is to basically is to the county what the mayor is to the city. And that's why this is so important because we have somebody who's been in the office who would just as soon have shut all the churches down and violated everybody's constitutional rights uh, under COVID. And we don't need somebody like that. And she doesn't have the kind of experience that we should have. And so I think that... Um, Alexandra Mueller is a good alternative, and so she's going to come and speak, and maybe a couple of others. Also, Camparete is um, next week. That's the 17th to the 24th of July. Vacation Bible School is during that same period here at the church, July 19th to 21st. Then at the end of the month, uh, we'll have a memorial service for Jay Collins on the 30th of July and also pray, pray for Jeff Phipps going to Brazil. Pray for the Myers as they're traveling. They'll be back here uh, next week sometime. And also pray for Dan Ingram. Dan has had uh, COVID, and he's, it's had some side effects that, are, um, that aren't good. And he's been, as a lot of you already know, he's been uh, dealing with a malignant tumor in his brain that is inoperable but they've been treating it, but at, that was aggravate, things were aggravated because of, the, uh, because of the COVID. And so please be in prayer for, for, um, for Dan. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus." Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure we are walking by the Spirit, that we're uh, in right relationship with the Lord in fellowship and are spiritually prepared to study the word this evening. And then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful we can come together as a body of believers tonight around your word to focus on what you have revealed to us extracting from the scripture the important lessons, principles, uh, spiritual values that we need in order to live our lives, that we may learn to walk worthy of you, walking by the Spirit, uh, walking in the light of your word. And Father, we pray that as we study your word that you will bring to our mind areas of application where we, that we need in our own lives that we may continue to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may be conformed to the image of Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 7. 
Judges chapter 7, and we're going to look at the beginning of this episode with the major battle with the Midianites and the Amalekites and the others from the east, and we're going to be focusing on the principle that God gives the victory. It is not to the one who runs the fastest. It is not to the one who has the most natural talents. The victory goes to the one who trusts in the Lord. And also we'll be looking at the problem of fear. So we have seen in our study of Judges that this is all about giving us the pathology of how a nation goes from spiritual maturity to pure paganism, to rebelliousness against God, and to uh, absolute self-destruction. And they go through these cycles uh, as we go through the book. And we see that that summarized in the first uh, two chapters in in uh, chapter 3, verse 6. And then the main part of the book shows the decline of the spiritual focus, the spiritual maturity, spiritual understanding of the leadership as they are influenced by the culture around us. And it is so difficult for us to realize how deeply each of us is affected by the culture around it. We just swim in this cesspool of the world all the time to where we don't necessarily realize that we're that's what we're doing. It's just everywhere. You just can't escape it. It's, it seems it is more overt than anything that we have experienced in our lives. But I think a lot of the cosmic thinking that was around us before was just so cloaked in camouflage that that's why it was so destructive in our culture. People were buying into things that sounded good but were basically uh, not good, all grounded ultimately in uh, autonomous human reason and arrogance. So in the last few weeks, rather than working our way verse by verse, we've been focusing on two Uh, two areas that the Bible teaches that come out of this section. One is on uh, what the Bible teaches about the will of God or divine guidance. And the summary there is that God is the one who tells us um, what his will is. He's very clear about it. It's not a guessing game. So that's the first part. And the other thing that we looked at was what the Bible teaches about the role of God the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And the last verse we looked at going through all these Old Testament verses is one of my favorites in Zechariah 5, 6, that it's not by power but by my spirit, says the Lord, not by might nor by power but by my spirit, that it is not on the basis of human ability at all. And that's a big lesson here in Judges chapter 7 that it is not on the basis of human ability. On the one hand, you have this this army of the Midianites and Melechites and others from the east that's sort of a more professional army, if we could use that term. They have a lot of experience, and they've been coming in uh, every year, invading into uh, Israel during the time of the harvest and basically raping the land and taking... Uh, all the produce, leaving just enough so they can survive and and have another harvest the next year, and as a uh, but and then the Israelites have just been cowering in fear, and now we're going to see that an army gathers around Gideon, but God does not want them to get the idea that they are going to win the battle uh, through their. Uh, through their own abilities. So these are the two areas, what the Bible teaches about the will of God or divine guidance and what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And so what we've seen is that Gideon should have absolutely no doubt about God's will, what God wants him to do. And I just go back to three key verses in Judges chapter 6. In the first verse, the Lord tells him exactly what's going to happen and that God's going to give him the, uh, the victory. And then uh, in verse 15, we see Gideon, a real foreshadowing of his weakness, that he tries to wiggle out of it. He comes up with an excuse why he shouldn't be the one to be the deliverer. And then the Lord makes an even 
more clear promise of his victory. In verse 14, he says to Gideon, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel. Now, this is another example where the word yasha, the verb yasha, meaning to save, really means to deliver from a problem. It doesn't have a soteriological justification, salvation uh, significance there. And then he replies, oh, how can I save Israel? I'm just a nobody. Go find somebody else. A lot like Moses, uh, also trying to wiggle out from under responsibility. And then the Lord gives the promise, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. So what we saw there is that God's will is usually very, very clear. In fact, what we find is that many believers are more like Gideon and they are trying to wiggle out from whatever their responsibility is. And um, recently I had an example of this in an email exchange with someone, and they were dealing with a problem within their extended family with um, a, a couple that was going through some in, an interesting situation, and they were leaning and looked like they're headed in one direction. And so this person wrote to me, this is such a great example of how many Christians operate. It comes down to what they think is God's path for them. They both want to do God's will for their lives. Well, that's great, theoretically. And you hear a lot of people who say, well, I'm facing this situation. I want to do what God wants me to do. And in this particular case... Uh, then this person went on to say, I can't tell anyone what God's will for their life is. Really? Sometimes you can. It's very clear in Scripture that you can tell somebody what the, God's will is. They have to uh, figure it out on their own, and I can only pray with them. And my answer was, well, what one of them wants to do is specifically prohibited by Scripture. The scripture says exactly what God's will is in this particular matter. And obviously they want to be like Gideon and avoid responsibility and find some workaround uh, for God's specific statement. And there's just, that's just so common today. And that's part of paganism. We, want, we don't like what the word of God says. We don't want to do exactly what the Word of God says because we have grown up in this arrogant, self-absorbed uh, culture where we're constantly in self-indulgence and g- doing whatever we really want to do, and then somehow we find a Bible verse to s- slap on it and make it sound like this is this is okay with God. And the problem is that most Christians today... Even Christians who are in pulpits are spiritually immature. They don't understand the Word of God. They don't understand grace. They don't understand God's plan for their life. They don't have a framework for understanding all of Scripture, and they're never taught in a verse-by-verse manner going through the Scripture. Sometimes they are, but it's, it's, it's shallow. And I didn't announce this, but two weeks ago... Uh, Dr. Ed Heinsen, who was on the board for pre-trib rapture, went to be with the Lord. He'd been ill for some time. And um, uh, I got to know Ed about, I don't know, that was about 16, 17 years ago, not long before we started the church, on a trip to Israel, I mean uh, to uh, Greece and Turkey with uh, Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice and Ed. And Ed and I were having a conversation about the philosophy of teaching and sort of the philosophy of teaching ministry from the pulpit. And, uh, and he made a comment to me. He said, he said, Robbie, Baptists are wonderful people, but their theology is a mile wide and an inch deep, and they think it's an inch wide and a mile deep. And that's not just true for Baptists. I'm not picking on Baptists. That's true for a lot of Christians. And they are, as a result, not really in a position where they know how to make decisions on the basis of God's will. They're they're more like Gideon than uh, they would like to admit if they even know who Gideon is, which is part of the problem. And um, 
Then we come to the second issue, which is the role of God, the Holy Spirit. In Judges 6.34, we read, But the Spirit of Yahweh came upon Gideon, and then he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered around him. So we see the sort of a cause and effect that the coming of the Spirit of the Lord on Gideon is related to his uh, military uh, responsibilities as a judge. It doesn't have anything to do with his spiritual life. It doesn't have to do with anything like the indwelling of the Spirit in the church age, the filling of the Spirit in the church age. Uh, It has to do with the divine enablement to accomplish responsibilities related to leadership in the theocratic kingdom of Israel to fulfill the responsibilities of the Mosaic, Mosaic law. So it just comes down to understanding uh, Zechariah 4, 6, that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's a big part of the lesson of Judges chapter 7, that the nation needs to learn that it's not on the basis of their uh, military skill or technology or numbers. It's the God plus one is, a, is the majority. So what they ultimately have to learn is that it's all based on grace and depending upon God's grace. And grace is based not on who we are, but on who God is. It's based on God's character, and God's character is clearly laid out in the Mosaic Law. And he clearly describes how they should live, how they should think, how they should behave, and how they should depend upon him. But they failed. And God shows his grace all through judges in the same way he does with us. God always meets us where we are. God does not say, okay, you have really messed up this time. So when you get it straightened out and you get back to where you were or you advance a few more steps, then we'll have a conversation and we can go forward. God doesn't ever do that. God doesn't say, okay, you really messed up. I'll wait for you to straighten it all out and then we can go forward. God meets us where we are, even if we're backsliding and we backslide so far and God meets us there and then we backslide further and God meets us there. That's exactly what happens to all of Judges. God does ne- God never gives up on Israel. That's grace. They don't deserve it. It is God's character, his immutability, his love, all are on display. So God meets us where we are and not where we should be. And God wants to make sure that we understand that it's not on the basis of our abilities, but on the basis of his ability. So grace orientation is fundamental to spiritual growth. We first understand just a glimpse of grace when we understand salvation, that we are saved by grace. It's not based on anything we do whatsoever. It's not based on any level of morality on our part. It's not based on our wonderful personality. It's not based on how nice we are. It's not based on the things that we did and that somehow God wants to save us because we're just so so important that he needs us in heaven. It's all based on God's grace because none of us deserve anything. And so that is the basis of grace orientation. And that's what Gideon needs to learn. He needs to learn to be dependent upon God and let God deal with the circumstance and the situation. So this takes us to the first verse of the chapter where we read then Jeroboam, that is Gideon. Remember, Gideon has two names. We'll talk about that in a minute. And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. So this provides the setting. It tells us where they are, tells us who's there, who the major players are, and it gives us a geographical orientation so we can go and look uh, look precisely at it. So the first thing we need to talk about and look at is this use of this name, and when we look at this, the name Jeroboam is made up of uh, J-E-R-U-B as the prefix and Baal is the second, which is 
literally it means Lord, but it is the name of a pagan Canaanite deity. And after uh, Gideon tore down the altar to Baal and the Asherah, uh, his his father gives him this this name, and this it, he becomes referred to by this name uh, numerous places in the Old Testament. But as I pointed out, going through various passages, that often it is changed. In fact, there are others in the um, in the Old Testament whose name, for example, is uh, uh, Meribaal or Ishbaal, and their names then are changed to Ishbosheth and uh, Meribosheth, and to Je- and Gideon is referred to n- not infrequently as Jerobosheth, and Bosheth has the idea of shame. And so it brings this that this element of shame into the uh, into the picture, and so the, the, what's going on in the text is interesting because he's referred to as Jeroboam and then he's referred to as as uh, Gideon, and each time the, the, this name is used, it is bringing something out about. Uh, the nature of Gideon at this particular time. And um, basically when his father comes out and names him this, on the surface it sounds like he is saying, well, let uh, let Baal contend for himself. And it turns out that if you really take a, a look at it, he's, um, uh, he's not saying, well, if Baal exists, then let him come down and he'll take care of things on his own. Um, what he is actually saying is Baal will contend for himself and he will take care of things. And that is a, a rebuke of Gideon's relationship to God. And it also foreshadows what will eventually happen because Gideon is going to lead the people right back into, uh, into idolatrous worship. So the only other places where you have Gideon called Gideon outside of these chapters is in Hebrews 11, which tends to focus on Gideon as a positive aspect of his, of his name uh, and indicating that when he, you call Gideon, he's, that's a positive reference, and he's obedient to the Lord at that time. So that's the first part of this. This is uh, Jeroboam, which tells us that there's, it's a hint and foreshadowing of the problems that will come. But it also is emphasizing the fact that he is still extremely uncertain about being able to trust God and that God's going to give him the victory, not unlike a lot of baby believers. They, just, they, they, want, to, they want to trust God and handle it themselves. And that's often true of us, even if we're not a baby believer. And the next thing it points out is that uh, the people who are with him are going to uh, form up and camp by the well of Herod, which is located in the Jezreel Valley, as we'll see in just a second. And we're told... um, Back in 633, that the army of the Midianites and the Amalekites had come in from the east. They gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the Valley of Jezreel. So we know that this is in the Valley of Jezreel. That's where Herod Springs is located, and that's where the uh, the uh, Midianites are. And they are on the north side of Herod Spring, north of that by the hill Mora. So that gives us uh, the setting. So we're going to look at a few pictures and a few maps to just understand a little bit about where this is. So this is a really bright... I've got a couple of maps in here. I need. I just want to find out how well they display now that we have a, a much more bright projector. But here we have... Uh, the. You can always remember the basic geography of Israel that they have... On the on the left side or the west side, you have the Mediterranean Sea, and on the right side, you have the Jordan River, and th- that's the basic boundary of the main part of the land. 
And in the north, there's the Sea of Galilee. And from the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River flows down to the next body of water, which is not on this slide, and that's the Dead Sea. And so to the north, you have Galilee. To the south, you have Judah. And then during the intertestamental period, you have some area in between, which is Samaria. And if you get that, you can think your way through the geography of Israel pretty easily. So the Jezreel Valley is north of Samaria. It comes down from this little uh, loop in the coastline, which is where, um, uh, where there's a major deep water port here at Haifa. And this valley is the breadbasket of Israel. It is uh, incredibly rich farmland. And so it's bordered on the southwest side by the Mount Carmel Ridge, which is where Elijah challenged the prophets of, of Baal. And, you know, it's all, you'll see a couple of pictures. It's all compressed here. Most of what happens in the Bible happens all in this, this area. You have the uh, city of Jezreel, which becomes an important city in the northern kingdom. Uh, you have uh, Mount Gilboa. Right down here, that is where we'll see a closer picture. That's where Saul uh, was killed in the uh, battle with with the Philistines. And up on the north side along here, you don't have it on this map, but you have Nazareth. And then um, you go up here, Tiberias is on the Sea of Galilee. And so a lot of New Testament things all happened just in this particular area. This is more of a, that shows up a whole lot better than it does on my laptop. This is a uh, another topographical map, so you can see the elevated ridge lines going down on the on the western side of the valley, and some others on the northern side. And all of this darker green in the middle along the Kishon River is the Jezreel Valley, otherwise known as the Valley of Megiddo, which is a very ancient site here. So far, they've uh, when they've excavated it, they've got over thirty layers of the city, and it is on a tell, which is like a mountain. A tell is a a term for a a mound, and the the tell Megiddo is called Har Megiddo, which is where we get the word Armageddon, and so this is not only the Valley of Jezreel, it's the uh, Valley of Megiddo or Har Megiddo, so this is uh, the area where people think the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place here. The word for battle is a word that means a campaign. And so it involves numerous battles, and this is probably the staging area where all of the military supplies and everything will be, will be brought in from, uh, from this deep water port up here with Haifa. But you come down this valley, you have um, uh, Ain Harad, which is the Harad Spring right here, uh, where I kind of moved it so the stars are not right on the... Um, absolute location here. You have Indoor where the Witch of Indoor was. You have down here Ain Harad is at the base of Mount Gilboa where Saul was killed. These are, this is the area that we're talking about right here. Oprah here, this is where uh, Gideon was from, where Gideon grew up. Here's another look at the same thing, a little different map. Herod Spring here, Mora here, Mora is where the Amalekites and the, and the Midianites have their troops, and Herod Springs is where uh, Gideon's uh, army will, um, will form up, and that's at the base of Mount, Mount Gilboa. So the scripture says that Mount Mora is north of Herod Spring. This is another more battle, battle map. We'll look at this a little more, and this is the Hill of Mora where the uh, Malachite, Midianite troops are uh, bivouacked, and then in Harad down, uh, down below here. So this, each of these maps just looks at it a little, a little bit differently, but uh, the visuals are a little better, and we can see the topography and the layout here, which is important. Now here, if you if you've never been to Israel, some of you have, some of you haven't. This is a great picture. If you're standing on Mount Carmel where Elijah challenge the priests of Baal and Asherah, then you see this on a clear day. 
Uh, down below, this is where the Kishon River runs, and right now it's just an intermittent stream because most of the water is bled off for irrigation in the valley. But here you have the location of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. And then just to the right of that, you have this uh, unique-looking uh, hill that's Mount Tabor. And then you have an uh, open valley here, and then next to that, there's the hill of Moreh. This is where the Amalekites and Midianites are going to uh, be encamped. And then across from there, you have Mount Gilboa, and right here at the base is Herod Springs. So you see all of this area uh, down here to the right. That's uh, where you're going to see the ruins for um, for uh, Mid uh, excuse me for Megiddo. Here's another view. This is Mount Tavor. And that's where Deborah and Barak gathered their troops for their uh, fight with the Canaanites and the chariots in the valley. Across the way here, this is where the Hill of Mora is. And then, can't get all of it in in a clear picture, but just off to the right is going to be the Mount Gilboa. So Mount Gilboa is here. Herod Springs is here. Across this valley, you have uh, Endor, where the Witch of Endor was, and then the Hill of Mora. And, of course, remember at the end of Samuel where uh, Saul goes to get uh, demonic guidance from the witch of Endor as to what's going to happen to him. Uh, that's going out into this valley here, and then the battle takes place at the foot of Mount Gilboa, which is where, uh, where he's going to be killed. So this gives us a good aerial. You have... Uh, this is on the lower shoulder of Mount Gilboa, and down here in this shadow area is where Ain Harad is. Ain is the Hebrew for spring. So this is the spring of Harad, and this is what it looks like now. There's not a lot of water there. Uh, it flows out. This is a picture, again, of the little stream that's there. I, I was looking for it, and I've used it before, but I have a black and white picture taken in the 1880s that shows just a huge amount of water here. Uh, and so that shows the difference in the last 140 years that so much water gets gets bled off. And here are some uh, IDF soldiers sort of uh, reenacting the scene of uh, Gideon's, Gideon's army. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what this area looks like, what the land looks like and uh, the geography, which we'll get into as we go through the battle itself. The point of this opening introduction in the first uh, four, four or five verses is that God's plan is to make it clear uh, to everyone that the victory that will come is his victory. It's not Gideon's. It's not the Israelites' victory. It's not due to their skill or their training or their weaponry or any other factor. It is totally due to God, and he's going to make that very clear. In Judges 7, verse 2, we read, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. Now, that's really interesting. You don't have enough. You have too many soldiers. The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. So it's very clear God is the one who's going to give them the victory. Giving the Midianites into their hands is an idiom for giving you the victory. Lest, very clear, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying my own hand has saved me. He wants to make it very clear that that the Israelites can't make any claim that they've done something to get the victory. It's all grace. So what do we have? In chapter 8, we're told that the Midianites had an army of 135,000. Gideon had an army of 32,000. That means that, that Gideon is outnumbered a little over 4 to 1. Now, those aren't bad odds. There's plenty of times in military history where armies that have been outnumbered 4 to 1 have had a victory, but... It's still possible that that if they won with with their thirty two thousand that they could claim that they did it on their own and they would be uh, arrogant about it. So God says you have too many. So He reduces them in the first test to ten thousand. Now we'll look at what the problem is here. He says, everyone, if you're if you're afraid, go home. 
And so they are reduced. 10,000 say, I'm not proud. I'm afraid. I'm going to go home. So he gets rid of all of those who are willing to admit that they're cowards. And that reduce, that changes the, from four to one to 13 and a half to one. And God says, still have too many. You know, being outnumbered 13 and a half to one is, you can still take credit if you have victory. So we're going to make it clear that, that, that you can't take credit. And so, uh, they're going to be reduced to 300, which changes the odds to 450 to one. Now it looks pretty much impossible that 300 untrained troops are going to be able to take on 135,000 trained and experienced troops. But the odds are now in God's favor because he's going to demonstrate that even if there was only one, that he was, would give them the victory. So God gives the analysis that if Israel... Uh, wins with four to one odds against them that they could still claim the claim the victory, and he makes it very clear that God, that he understands this. Second thing we see from this is that God knows that both Gideon and many of the men are doubting and in fear, including Gideon. He is still uncertain, so much so that God's going to have to give him another shot of confidence and this time it's going to come through a dream that god is going to give to one of the midianite sentries and we'll get into that next time so god wants to make it very clear that he's not going to do this with people who are fearful and so we have the uh, word for fear here uh, the noun for fear whoever is fearful and then the second word is a form of that word. The, the yare is Y-R-E or Y-R Aleph. And then he has the word aharad. And this is uh, formed uh, from a cognate. And it has the idea of trembling. And it's used that way in um, 1 Samuel 4.13 that when Israel heard that uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in danger. He trembled. And so what, what's happening, these guys are scared to death. They're sh- literally, truly shaking in their boots. Uh, they do not want to go into battle. And it's amazing how fear can take over when you're that way. All of a sudden you hear something and, and it's, it, it, it's visceral. It's physical. And if you don't deal with it immediately with the Word of God, then you're going to be in serious trouble. I remember when um, when we were in Kiev and the war started and I'd heard the initial explosions, I read an article that, was, uh, that somebody sent me right about that time at, at, that was outlining exactly what to expect that the Russian troops were going to do. First thing, they're going to take out all the electricity. Second thing they're going to do is they're going to take out the Internet. Third thing they're going to do is that they're going to send in uh, their troops and capture the major cities within about 24 hours. So you're not going to have any Internet. You're not going to have any transportation. You're not going to have any, any, um, any form of communication with anybody and no, no electricity. So you just immediately you just almost tighten up what in the world am I going to do? And then I said, well, I'm just going to relax in the Lord. So I just start claiming promises and just immediately relaxed. And that's all you can do. But that fear has this strange way of just taking control of your mind. And it's, it's, it's physical. It feels like it's a physical reaction uh, to something. And so what we want to see here is that God is not going to have a victory with these soldiers that are fearful and trembling because that's the opposite of trusting God. So y'all go home. So we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about fear. First of all, we have to understand that fear is the opposite of trust in God. Fear is, is looking at a circumstance or situation and realizing you're incapable of handling it, and then you just sort of seize up because of all the negative consequences that can come your way. And it's contrasted with trust in many places 
but it's also contrasted with love. This is one of the most interesting verses in Scripture is in 1 John 4, 18, because most of us, if we were asked, well, what's the opposite of love, we would not say fear. But that's what the Holy Spirit teaches us in 1 John 4, 18, that there is no fear in love. So love excludes fear if you understand what biblical love is, and that's always difficult for all of us. And John goes on to say, but a complete or mature love, it's not perfect love because that contains the idea that that love is flawless, that you've reached some sort of level of perfection and you have perfect, flawless love. That's not what it's saying. It's, it's a complete love. You have come to understand uh, and develop love for personal love for God the Father. And as you develop that love for God, your focus is on God, and it's not on circumstances, and it's not on people, and it's not on things. So that complete love, that mature love, casts out fear. When you take a look at your love for God, you realize God cares for you more than anything else, and so whatever happens, God's going to take care of you. So uh, mature love casts out fear because fear involves, and then the word is punishment. Now, it's, it's, there are a couple of different views on this. It may be that b- both are involved. Sometimes scripture is that way, that it uses a word to, which captures both. One is it includes its own punishment, that if you get sucked into a fearful lifestyle, a life based on fear, then it will produce its own punishment. And the danger we have in our culture today is over the last three years, we have been trained to operate on fear with the way that uh, the the pandemic was politicized and the way that so much uh, false information was put out in the media. Now, I don't I'm not saying one side was false and one side wasn't. I think there was just a tremendous amount of misinformation and disinformation put out, and it could have been put out by everyone. I don't know what to trust in some things, and I'm just saying we were taught to operate on fear. Oh, we're all going to die. There's going to be 3 million people. And the way it was said, that 3 million people or 5 million people were going to die from COVID. But they never said over what length of time. Over the next 100 years, well, that's not so bad. Over the next 100 days, well, that could be pretty serious. That, that's like the Black Death. So, uh, But they, they just put that out, and what it does is it generates fear, and people will do whatever they can and if they're told that it will help them ameliorate and the, the causes or the consequences of COVID and what's going to happen. And you see how things have changed. I think a lot of people looked at... Uh, the vaccinations and have read that there's a lot of problems with vaccinations and they're not true vaccinations, that people are not immune, immunized by these vaccines. And there's a lot of other problems. I don't know what to believe. You read numerous things. I read something that was put out by the World Health Organization the other day that said that if you took one of the vaccines, that there was a 339 per, uh, percent chance chance or greater chance that you would have serious complications than if you just had covid and um and might might go into the hospital now i don't know if that's true or not but you see things like this and then you see claims and counterclaims and all we can do is trust trust the lord and make our own wise decisions So we can't operate on fear, though. Once a nation starts making policy based on fear, then you're in serious trouble. Panic and emotional reaction is never the basis for good, objective, wise decision-making. So this is what Scripture is teaching here, is that you have to cast out fear. And that can only come for a believer who's in right relationship with the Lord because then you understand he's in control and you can rest in him and not get caught up in all of the panic and reading all the panic porn and everything else that is designed to frighten and intimidate. 
So fear is the opposite of trust in God. Second, when we're operating on fear, we're no longer trusting God, and therefore we cannot walk by faith. You're either walking by faith, walking by the Holy Spirit, or you're walking on the basis of your sin nature. And fear is an emotional sin that is generated out of your sin nature as a result of arrogance. Third point, faith looks at a, uh, fear looks at a problem, a threat, a danger, and sees no solution and pushes the panic button. But faith looks at the problem or the threat or the danger in terms of the love and protection, omnipotence, and faithfulness of God. You start by working your way through the essence box. You think about how does God's sovereignty relate to this problem? How does God's righteousness relate to this problem? How does his justice relate to this problem? How does his love, his eternality, his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, how do all of these things and his immutability, how do these things, these attributes of God, who God is, relate to my problem? And then you logically apply these those to your thinking, and that's what brings stability into your soul so that you're not going to panic. What's the absolute worst thing that could happen? Well, the worst thing is you could suffer and then die. Well, then you're in heaven. I've heard people say, well, well, um, they make these comments about about death and they'll, they'll make something, some comment about something being bad and they say, well, it could be worse. And, um, and I say, well, if you die, you're with the Lord, so that's not worse, that's better. So we don't have to worry about that. We know exactly what our destiny is. So fear looks at the problem and sees no, no solution. Fourth, fear seems to be the basic orientation of fallen man, that there is this core of, a, of our nature because we're fallen creatures no longer in, perf- in a perfect environment that we're scared. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden after Eve then Adam ate the fruit, then they realized, Scripture says that they were naked, they were vulnerable to everything. And when God showed up, they, there's this visceral reaction to God's righteousness and justice. You see the same thing when Isaiah appears before God in Isaiah chapter 6. He just immediately screams out, woe is me, a man of unclean lips, the being in the presence of God's perfections of his perfect righteousness penetrates to the depths of our soul that we are unworthy. And so Adam and Eve run and hide. And God asks them the question, not because he doesn't know, but he asks questions. Jesus does the same thing in the Gospels. He asks questions to get people to think about things. Too often when we're witnessing or talking to somebody, uh, things will deteriorate into an argument rather than being calm and patient, realizing this isn't a one-shot opportunity. It's multiple shots, and just be calm and ask a question. Well, how did you come up with that? What's your, what, what's your basis of, if you say that's true, what's your basis for saying that? So God asked Adam, and he said, where are you? getting them to focus on the fact that they're not responding to God like they did before and they're not coming up to enjoy his presence but running and hiding from him. And Adam says, well, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. That's the first consequence we see of sin is that they are fearful. They're afraid of God. They're in a state of of spiritual death, alienated from the life of God, and they are fearful. And so they try to solve the problem themselves. So fear is at the very core of, uh, of the sin nature. And because of fear, it's motivated to protect itself, defend itself, solve the problems itself, all apart from God. Fifth, fear is an emotional sin that attempts to overpower rationality, and often it does overpower rationality. Fear, t- fear takes over, and it's like reason just flies out the window, 
and objectivity flies out the window and we're just seized by this emotion. When it's not stifled by faith, it develops into panic and an inability to think calmly and to make good decisions. Fear destroys inner peace and stability and tranquility. And so when we're operating on fear, we make decisions from a position of weakness rather than from a position of strength. And we often get in a big hurry, like we have to solve everything right now because if we don't, then the whole world's going to blow up and we're all going to die, and what are we going to do? Sixth, fear believes only we can solve our problems and we cannot solve the problems we face. It, it leaves God out of the equation. It's all about aut- personal autonomy. We're independent from God, and we have to solve all of our problems ourselves. So fear operates on arrogance. Fear is related to arrogance in that it's total self-absorption, and it's t- totally focused on self-protection. So what are some things we learn about the function of fear? First of all, the more things you fear, the more things you will surrender to fear. That once you become a person who is motivated and operates on the basis of fear, you'll fear more and more things, and your fear will grow. Second thing is the extent to which we surrender things to fear the greater our capacity will uh, uh, to, will be to fear. Will that capacity? If you flip it the other side, the more you learn the Scripture, the more you trust God, the more you develop your capacity to trust God. But if you reject God, then you're going to operate more and more on fear, and you will become fearful and trembling as these soldiers were in the Israelite army. Third. The greater your capacity for fear, the more you increase the power of fear in your life so that we become fearful people. And people who are in the body of Christ have no right to ever be afraid, to ever be worried or anxious because God is the one who's in control. So forth, the more we increase the power of fear in our lives, the greater our failure to be able to execute the plan of God for our lives, to be able to live the spiritual life of the church age believer. Fifth, God, uh, fear replaces a God focus with a creature focus. It's worshiping the creature or the creation rather than the creator, Romans chapter 1. And so we try to resolve that fear through anything that distracts us. Drugs, alcohol, entertainment, sports, food, anything, anything, any detail in life, we can blow out of proportion to become the solution to our, our, our fear problem. And so that uh, we avoid dealing with the real issue, which is our fear of being independent of God. Sixth point is that a soldier cannot exercise self-control in a dangerous situation by relying, uh, excuse me, a soldier that cannot exercise self-control in a dangerous situation relies on emotion and becomes a danger to all. God is getting, fear can be contagious. One person panics and next person panics and everybody's running around in a circle without any control whatsoever, all operating on fear. God's solution to fear is orientation to grace, orientation to God's plan and purposes, and orientation to what the Bible teaches. It's amazing. You get in a position where you think everything's out of control and fear begins to well up, and you start saying promises in how everything calms down, how you reorient your thinking and uh, there 's restores stability and tranquility now you can make good objective decisions about what needs to be done that doesn 't mean the problem goes away that doesn 't mean everything 's going to be uh, perfect. It means that you have a way to to trust God and to handle the situation that will bring a reasonably good solution. 
And what we have to do is to claim some promises. So I've put together some promises that are good promises to rely on. Psalm 34.4, David writes, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. We have to be oriented to God and his grace and he delivers us from our fears, our worries, and our anxieties. Of course, one that we're very familiar with, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed. For I am your God, I will strengthen to you, I will help you, yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. It's God's integrity that holds us up, that the, the, everything can be crashing down around us. We may even be arrested, beaten, tortured, thrown in prison, and burned at the stake, as so many people in the Reformation were. And they had a peace that surpassed all comprehension because they were focused on God. And I always remember uh, the story of uh, some of the great, uh, great martyrs in England like Thomas Cranmer. And Cranmer was tortured and tortured until he couldn't stand it anymore. And he signed a document recanting of his faith on the promise that he would be released and he could go home and live out his life with his family. But once he signed it, it was used for propaganda purposes against the Protestants, and they kept him in prison. They were still going to burn him at the stake. So when they lit the fires at his feet and the flames began to rise, he took the hand that had signed his recantation and he held it in the flames saying that he was going to burn off this hand that had betrayed the Lord, and then he sang hymns to the glory of God until the Lord took him. That's just amazing. But you don't get there because all of a sudden you wake up one day and I've got a couple of promises, I'm going to use them. You have to grow and mature in the word, and God gives you that dying grace to be able to do that. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and reciprocal love and sound judgment. God has given us a spirit of, 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 of not given us a spirit of fear. Psalm 31.24, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. We have Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3 that, that he prays that the Holy Spirit would strengthen them in the inner man. And that's not going to come about unless the Ephesians are in the word and trusting the Lord and growing. He shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's what God's trying to teach Gideon and the 300. I love these two verses out of Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8. This is when Moses is giving his farewell parting address to the Israelites before he goes up on Mount Nebo to be taken to be with the Lord. He says, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Uh, Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. What did Jesus say to the disciples before um, before the ascension, he said, I will leave, never leave you nor forsake you. And then he gave them the great commission. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, 8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And then a verse we're very familiar with, I quote it frequently, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, every circumstance, every situation, no matter how negative, no matter how bad, you have no idea how God's going to use these things. We often re- react, we're uh, upset that something happened this way or that way. It wasn't our plan, but God's the one in control. Uh, so we, we uh, give thanks for everything. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. It, you can't understand it. You can't come to it on the basis of reason, but it will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So God is going to remove those who are fearful 
and then he's going to deal with those who aren't properly focused uh, when we get down to uh, verse 4 because the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Interesting word for testing there and we will look at that next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and for what you have provided for us in your word that we are to trust you that we are to relax, that you're in control. You know all the facts. We don't know anything, hardly. And we know all, you know everything there is to know about the circumstance, and you have the power and the ability to protect us no matter what happens. And even if, as the uh, three friends of Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, and even if we have to go through the fire, we know that you will take care of us. And so we are we recognize our need to learn to trust you more fully and to be more consistent in our application. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.